Hello, my lovely physiologists. Michelle Glass here. We're back. Chapter 10. We've been working on muscle fiber contraction. So here's basically where we left off, right? So we've said these are our big like umbrella steps to help guide us through, right? So we had our big first step. We didn't go into a lot of detail here. So I'm asking you to kind of trust me until we get to chapter 12. So the, the brain, the central nervous system is gonna generate the action potential. It's gonna travel down that motor neuron. And then our big step two is that signal reaching the synaptic knob. And then we kind of said the signal will like jump over or across that synaptic cleft to the uh, muscle fiber. And then our last video was dealing with that action potential um, propagating across the sarcolemma down into the cell at the T tubule. And maybe let's add in, maybe let's add in um, uh, triggering the release of calcium ion to our big step here, right? Because we said way back in our excitation contraction coupling conversation, that the action potential is coupled to the contraction through the calcium ion. So we left off with that calcium ion being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And our job now is to pick up on the cross bridge cycle. So actually getting us to the contraction. We took a look at this diagram already where we can see the details of what's going on at the neuromuscular junction. So we talked through the signal reaching the end of the motor neuron. We saw that that triggers the exocytosis of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We saw acetylcholine diffusing across the synaptic cleft, binding to those chemically gated sodium channels that are part of the motor end plate, triggering that initial movement of sodium into the muscle fiber. And then after we get some of that initial movement of sodium into the muscle fiber, that triggers the opening of the voltage gated sodium channels. And we said that marks the beginning of that action potential. And the action potential really is, you know, our technical name for the electrical signal that we get or the nerve impulse, however you want to sort of translate that in your mind. It is the um, opening of the voltage gated sodium ion channels that initiates the action potential. So now we can say, okay, the action potential is traveling across the sarcolemma down into the middle of the cell um, through those T tubules, reaching that point we called the triad. The triad, remember, is where you have that kind of sandwich of the T tubule in between to terminal cisternae. Terminal cisternae, remember, are the enlarged chambers of the sarcoplasmic reticulum holding the calcium. And so when the action potential reached the triad that opens up a voltage-gated calcium channel in the SR, releasing calcium into the sarcoplasm. So that's exactly where we left off. Picking up here, what we're taking a look at at this particular diagram is we have a series of pictures. The first picture, or, or let me just say, with each of these pictures, we're seeing our thin filament and our thick filament. So the thin filament is shown there at the top. Remember, the thin filament is composed primarily of actin. Actin is showing um, up here as those like little green beads. And then we have a complex of proteins, the troponin tripomycin complex, which is kind of sitting on top of the actin. At rest, the troponin tripomycin complex covers up what we can call the active site. And so at rest, there's space in between the thin filament and the thick filament. We also are seeing the thick filament here shown in kind of this purplish color. Remember the thick filament is composed primarily of myosin. We talked about myosin as looking sort of like a golf club where it has like a tail and this flexible neck and then this head. 
and the head is the part of the molecule that is attracted to and wants to bind with um, actin. So this is what we're looking at next. So we left off, we left off with our calcium flooding the sarcoplasm. We left off with calcium flooding the sarcoplasm. And what is the calcium going to do? So the calcium, which we can see in this diagram here, the calcium the calcium ion is going to um, bind to troponin. Calcium ion binds to troponin. When the calcium ion binds to troponin, it changes the shape of troponin and we get the troponin tropomyosin complex to shift off the actin active site. So we can call it an active site or we can call it the myosin binding site. So I think in our previous, in our previous uh, labeling, it was called a myosin binding site. Some texts will call it an active site. The active site is this spot where the myosin can grab hold of the actin. At rest, the troponin tropomyosin complex is sitting on top of that active site. When the calcium comes in and binds, it changes the shape of the troponin. The troponin then is no longer holding the tropomyosin in place and the whole thing shifts. And when it shifts, then those active sites become available. And as soon as the active site is available, the myosin head is gonna grab, and this is a very active process. I think it's totally fine to think of it as like grab and hold. It's gonna grab the um, actin. And we call this the cross bridge formation. I don't really have a lot of room here, so I'm just gonna call it cross bridge in my notes. You might want to think about the, um, the actin and the myosin, as you know, being super attracted to each other, right? And so I don't know if you've all kind of uh, seen maybe in some older movies where you'd have the high school dance and you'd have the boys and girls um, the couples, I should say, get in really close, bodies touching, and then maybe the older chaperone comes along and sticks it, a blown up balloon in between the couples so, so they're not touching each other, right? Um, and so maybe the troponin is holding the tropomyosin in place um, over this active site, sort of like the balloon in between the dancing couples, right? And as soon as that balloon is gone, um, then, then they touch each other. And we call that the cross bridge formation. Now, um, let me go back to something earlier. Let's make a few notes on the side here just to kind of clarify a few things. So we've talked about the myosin head as both being um, attracted to actin, but it also has an ATP ACE, which means this is the enzyme that's gonna break down ATP into ADP, adenosine diphosphate and phosphate. And when we do this breakdown, remember, we're releasing energy because that bond between those phosphate groups is a high energy bond. And so that's the whole beauty of the ATP molecule. When the myosin head is at rest, when the skeletal muscle is at rest, the skeletal muscle cell is at rest, 
the myosin head we call we call it or describe it as being energized because it's going to be holding all of this it's going to be holding the adp it's going to be holding the phosphate it's going to be holding that energy so you might want to think about it as like leaving the engine running on the getaway car right it we not hit the gas, the car is not moving, but the car is turned on and it's ready. The second you hit the gas, all of that energy is released, right? And so in the case of the myosin head being energized, it's sort of in this same way. It's already, the myosin head has already broken down the ATP into an adenosine diphosphate, a phosphate group, and it's holding that energy. So we call it as, we describe it as being energized. And then we also use this um, phrasing as um, it's copped, meaning it's in a position to move. So that resting myosin head is very much like ready for action, ready for action. So when we go back to this picture that we were looking at a minute ago, too many clicks, and we see the cross bridge formation, Notice the myosin head is holding on to the ADP in the phosphate. So that tells us that that head is energized, okay? That head is in that cocked position, right? It's energized, it's cocked. Now it's grabbed hold of the actin because the calcium has bound to the troponin and the troponin tripomycin complex is totally out of the way, okay? And the next picture, what we see is what's described as the power stroke. So the power stroke is talking about when the myosin head is going to release the energy, right? Because it was cocked, it was energized. It's going to release the energy. And it's going to pivot, pulling the actin toward the M line. M line, remember, is the middle of the sarcomere. So this is described as the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. So the myosin head reaches up and grabs the actin, releases that stored energy, does a pivot, and when it does that, it's pulling that actin, that thin filament, toward the M line. And notice then that the actin and the myosin are just like sliding across each other. They're sliding across each other. The next thing that happens is a new ATP is going to bind to the myosin head. When this happens, the myosin head detaches. So we can say cross bridge detachment. And we can also talk about the myosin head as re-energizing and re-cocking. Again, remember we said like it's starting out already at rest in this kind of energized and cocked position. It got in that situation because it grabbed an ATP and it broke down that ATP, but it held that energy here during this detachment during this detachment. In our last picture here, our last picture here is really showing that myosin head doing that um, re-energizing and that recocking. So I'm just gonna move those notes down to be aligned with that picture. Notice we still have calcium available. So we still have the troponin bound to calcium, which means that we still have the tropomyosin off of the active site. So what this means is as long as those active sites are available, that myosin is gonna reach up, grab, do a new cross bridge, do another power stroke and a detachment and so if we get continual cross bridge cycling, that's when we really start to have enough tension built in the whole muscle to really be producing movement. And so in this picture here, 
we're getting a nice summary of our steps. So here's like our big step number one, where the action potential is being generated by the central nervous system. Central nervous system means brain and spinal cord. And so I'm gonna just abbreviate that um, step there. The big step two that we can see here, we already um, talked through this in detail. So this is actually showing us both the activity at the neuromuscular junction where we saw the signal um, jumping across that synaptic cleft with the help of the uh, neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And then we see the signal kind of, um, I'm gonna say here action potential reaches triad and that gives us the release of the calcium from the SR and then we're seeing our cross bridge cycling in this next um, image and then we're seeing the um, muscle fiber shortens and then ultimately the whole muscle can shorten and that's gonna pull on bones and produce those action terms that we talked about in chapter nine. So in this particular diagram, it's a combination of images that we've seen earlier. So we have that picture of the neuron synapsing onto the muscle fiber. We get the close-up shot of that synaptic um, of that neuromuscular junction where we have the synaptic knob and the motor end plate. We see the movement of the action potential across the sarcolemma down into that T-tubule, reaching the SR, triggering the release of calcium, that calcium going in to um, the sarcoplasm, binding with our troponin, causing a shift in our troponin tropomycin complex, leading to cross bridge um, formation, and then we see our muscle fiber represented as shortening and our whole muscle represented as shortening. Okay, so your task here is to make sure you can put all these steps together into a single story of how the muscle fiber is contracting, starting with our sort of big step number one, and then working your way all the way through until you get through the details of the cross bridge cycle. As always, take care of yourselves and each other.